So as I'm working through the hives, I come across this unit that is obviously queenless. As soon as I open them up, I can hear this hum, queenless hum. Look them out the front there. There seems to be a good mass of bees in here, probably three or four frames worth of bees. They're not organized. They're just kind of hummy. There's no eggs in this colony. So this is obviously a queenless unit. Queen died over the winter probably. But there's a mass of bees in here. You can probably hear that hum. So there's three or four frames of bees in here that I want to salvage. Do you hear that hum? That sound is 100% queenless. Okay, so when I have all these bees in here, I could simply just shake them out for another colony. They'd go into this guy and, and live on life. But what I want to do is Instead of taking the direct loss of this, I want to use these bees. I want to kind of use them towards a strategy of boosting a weaker unit. So what I'm going to do is I've identified a smaller unit in my apiary here, like two or three frames of bees. Nice little you know patch of brood with the queen. So I want to salvage that hive because that queen is giving a little bit of um, initiative just to you know she wants to be around. So I'm going to promote that. I'm gonna give her all these bees. And then it's up to her to show her brilliance. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna merge those two colonies together. So I'm gonna merge them with a slow merger method. I use newspaper. Basically all I'm doing is I'm gonna cover, in between the two boxes, I'm going to separate with a sheet of newspaper kind of break it in a few places. I'm going to put the small unit on top and as the bees chew through the newspaper they'll mingle and merge and hopefully uh, the two units combine together as one. bottom unit has, you know, three or four frames of bees. This top unit is very small. There's half a frame of bees there. Looking at, you know, a little bit of bees here. A real nice brood pattern going on. There's the queen, she looks healthy. So she has like half a frame of brood going on. It's probably a frame of bees. I'm anticipating that these two colonies will merge. These bees are gonna smell the queen, they're gonna come up. They're gonna slowly unite with this top colony and give these bees more population to bring them above that population threshold and then it's going to allow that queen to expand and grow and develop as as she should. We'll give them probably two weeks. I'll come back take a look and see where it all settles out. It's just one of those little beekeeper tricks to uh, to keep bees in these boxes, just to keep these boxes full of bees. 
uh, just to boost up colonies which you know may have fallen back to other situations other than their fault of their own uh, just allows us to provide a little bit more time to these colonies a little bit more resource and then we can adequately uh, assess them later on to make sure they're viable so it's about this time of year when my phone starts ringing off the hook from neighbors complaining about the bothersome bees these bees the trees haven't come out and bloom yet so they're just scouring the area for any type of protein and they just love to come to cattle yards and search out the feed that we're feeding our animals here's a pile of DDGs this is uh, this was sent to the corn distiller to make ethanol and this is the byproduct we buy uh, we buy the byproduct to supplement our lactating animals with protein within their feed mix but anyways the bees smell it and they want it and as you can see they are trying their hardest to bring it back to the yard See them scurrying around in there. Problem is this is too coarse and they can't pick it up so they're just kind of walking and scurrying trying to get as much of that dust as they can out of their bodies to pack onto their pollen baskets. Whether or not they'll be able to digest it who knows but they just love the smell of this pile. Last fall, I think you'll remember, I was kind of freaking out a little bit because my uh, hives had shut down brood rearing middle of August and I could not get them to initiate a brood nest past uh, second last week of uh, August. I could not get them into September. And I was doing my math and my math is telling me these hives were destined for death. So as you'll remember, I was feeding Nutribee to the hives, trying to uh, stimulate that queen to rear a brood nest later into September, to rear that winter nest uh, into that September month, where typically that's a, those September bees are the ones that make the, uh, the winter into spring. But I could not get my hives to rear brood past that middle of August date. I could not, no matter how much uh, supplement I put on them or how I was feeding my syrup. No matter what I was doing, I could not get that nest to rear into September. But those bees were on the Nutri Bee and they were just devouring the stuff. They were, they, you would think they would be translating that supplement into the brood nest, into some brood rearing, but they weren't. And what I think was going on there, uh, the winter nest, those winter bees, they need to be uh, well developed, they need to be fat. They need to have access to pollen coming in uh, to pr provide them with the proteins and the fats they need to be able to store in their bodies to be able to get through the winter and provide the nourishment needed to rear that um, springtime nest. Because I had no because I had no pollen last fall, these highs were destined for failure. I was able to provide them with the nutrition they needed put on the fats, the proteins onto their bodies. They are developing a fantastic first round of brood here to be able to turn this winter nest into that spring nest. So I can confidently say now that all the efforts we had put into feeding supplement in the, uh, in the fall, I wasn't seeing it translate directly into the brood nest at that time, but, I, but now I'm seeing it, it was directly translating onto the fat stores of those bees which they're using now to develop this beautiful, beautiful nest. So this is the reason why I put a lot of attention on nutrition and just to help provide a little more predictability within my apiary. So I'm working through the apiary and I come across this yard, which um, I don't know if you'll remember last fall, but um, later on in September, uh, there's a little bit of criticism that I should have been feeding my apiary more supplement at the time. Uh, the comment was, I was missing the opportunity. I missed my opportunity. So these six hives, dead, 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 weak, weak. 
were the hives that I had put supplement on late in September. And as you can see, they're either dead or extremely weak, they'll probably die. Now the reason why I'm pointing this out is because I just want to show that conditions between beekeepers, between different apiaries, are all different. And we have to be able to recognize and manage the conditions at hand. Just because one beekeeper is having success doing one thing within his apiary doesn't mean it is going to directly translate into what we're going to be doing in our own apiary. So we've got to be extremely careful, especially with social media. You guys are watching these videos, everybody's on Facebook, and we're looking at everybody's success all the time and we're trying to mimic what they're doing. But what we have to do is we have to understand what's going on and then try to make that suit what we're doing within our environment and our conditions. Just because someone said I should have been feeding supplement to my hives late in the season to try to rear more brood would have resulted in catastrophic loss. And obviously that would have been the wrong decision. I know my apiary, I know my bees, I know how the hives set up their winter nest, I know how to promote the nutrition around uh, developing uh, a well-fed winter bee. I also know when to stop and you got to know those boundaries. So I'm not sure what happened there but all I know is tremendous success all the way down the line, all the way through the yard, all the way through the apiary except for the six that I treated individual and specific to a beekeeper suggestions. So today we worked through a yard and I've been taking samples all through the yard just to uh, analyze the, the, the mite counts and the uh, nosema infection within the apiary. And I've compiled it. I'm, I'm finding very little uh, varroa mite. I haven't found a mite actually. And I've compiled some samples together just to take a uh, just a good representation of the apiary and just looking for nosema. And I'm on slide number 10. And I've looked at 10 bees so far from this composite sample. And I have not seen a nosema spore yet. Zero. Which is awesome. So that just uh, shows me that my apiary has virtually no nosema infection. I'm going to send the sample away. I'm going to wait for the lab in uh, Winnipeg and at the U of M to start up and get my diagnosis through them. But for the time being, um, this is really good news. I'm not finding any nosema spores. Um, just that one hive that I identified as being as acting unusual in behavior. Um, that one was just riddled with nosema. But as far as taking a random sampling right through the apiary, zero nosema. And I haven't found a mite yet. So that is good news.